Spider-Man 1 is one of the greatest superhero movies of all time. It proved to the world that there was a way to do superhero media, and it set the world on fire with Spider-Man mania. Sam Raimi absolutely knocked it out of the park with his first film, and did even better with his second one. Okay, I, I still like that one too. But then, his movies got followed up by two different sets of completely new movies with new actors, new characters, new villains, all of that. Sam Raimi's movies end at Spider-Man 3, and there's no more after that, despite how many Twitter accounts will lie to you about it. Spider-Man 4 is not coming. There's no way. No way. You watch Spider-Man 1, you watch Spider-Man 2, you watch Spider-Man 3, and then you go watch Spider-Man No Way Home and you realize, like, the good part starts at, like, halfway through the movie and you don't even want to watch it anymore. And then it's over. Until you break out your fucking GameCube. Now let me tell you about this little game right here. It's called Spider-Man The Movie. But it's a video game. Everybody talks about Spider-Man 2, the movie, the game, or whatever, but never about its predecessor. This game is pretty good, too. Okay, but it's not as good as the second one, but I, I still think it's worth covering. This was one of the first attempts at a 3D Spider-Man game, with only a couple games before it. Everything isn't going to be perfect in this game, like, for example, the web swinging. The web swinging is very rudimentary. This was before Jamie Fistrom invented the swinging physics that almost every other Spider-Man game would try to implement on their own afterwards. You hold R to swing, and it takes you forward in a set arc every time. You hold R to accelerate even faster, but the faster you go, the more likely you are to slam into a wall faster than a shopping cart going downhill. And the game lets you get used to it by making it a huge part of the first level of the game. You see, the plot of this game isn't all too different from the movie it's obviously based on. The game puts you in the shoes of Peter Parker, who's just started his hunt for Uncle Ben's killer. The game then asks you to chase down different groups of criminals who all work within a group called the Skull Gang. Very original. You'll have to swing around to different rooftops, where you'll have to start beating the shit out of different Skull members to find out where Uncle Ben's killer is. After you finish absolutely destroying these normal men, You'll also notice that these roofs are decorated with these small, rotating spider logos. These serve as extra health points and web fluid exclusively. If you run out of web fluid, you'll still be able to swing, but you won't be able to use web attacks as frequently as if your bar was full. I find this odd because Tobey Maguire should be the last person who can run out of webbing due to his webbing being organic based. This makes me wonder if the game developers actually knew whether or not Toby was supposed to have organic webbing. Seeing as if you find the cheat menu, you can enter the code organic webbing to give yourself infinite webbing. The code even being here implies that this could be the case. I mean, I believe it. You can even see the web shooters in some shots of the original Spider-Man 1 movie because they took them out of the film so late. Anyway. You find the guy who knows where to find Uncle Ben's killer, and he points you in the right direction, and you swing your ass over there. You make it to the right roof, and the level ends as Peter swings over to the warehouse. Spider-Man then sneaks into the building. Huh, what's this door doing open? Man, people gotta be more careful. The cops could show up at any time. The game presents you with a warehouse filled with skull members. Now. You could fly in, and immediately start beating the shit out of everyone, or you could make use of the game's stealth mechanics by trying not to be seen while also wrestling with the camera. Hey, what circus in town? Nice, you messed with the wrong guy. Man, this game really makes you leap over hoops to catch Uncle Ben's killer. Like, I'm fucking flying through air vents to find fuses to put in boxes and shit. There are trucks flying at me and shit, and, and crashing into flames. This has got to be the most resourceful version of Uncle Ben's killer. 
It takes three whole levels just to catch him, but then he falls out the window and just dies. Just like in the movie, but the level ends right after he falls. I could have saved Uncle Ben. <laughs> These are the years when a man becomes the man he's going to be for the rest of his life. Just be careful who you change into. You're feeling this power of becoming a man, and with this great power comes great responsibility. Uncle Ben. Nothing could ever fill the hole left when he died. Those wounds never really heal. The beautiful redhead is Mary Jane Watson. The guy is Harry Osborne, my best friend. They stuck with me after Uncle Ben died. Harry's dad, Norman, was great too. He even let Harry and me stay in one of the apartments he owned after we graduated and moved into the city. I got a job with the Daily Bugle, taking pictures of... myself. Life sure is strange sometimes. No matter how much you want to hold on to a moment, you can't stop time from moving on. You don the classic Spider-Man suit after this level is over. And now, we can finally get to play as Spidey dicking around in the city. He's getting pictures for J. Jonah Jameson, which... I guess he got hired by? <laughs> Off screen, I guess? The game asks you to pose for a couple pictures as you explore the area. There's a bunch of weird shit to find in this area. Like the word chaos being rewritten in the sky constantly. I never understood what this could mean, despite my hours playing this game. Maybe it served as some light foreshadowing for events to come. Did you pray today? Did you pray today? Cause no, if you did it, I'ma have to dig you down on some gangster Make sure that you're praying, bro. Making sure that your soul is better, bro. Make sure you're raising your spirits, bro. All right. These robots were sent by Oscorp, which the game shows us in the. Actually, this is this is fairly decent CGI. I don't. I was gonna shit on it in the script, but I actually don't mind it. I think it looks fine. Unfortunately for CGI Willem Dafoe, these robots are no match for Spider-Man. He kicks their asses and swings off into the sunset. Now I want to take a second to talk about the save station in this game. It's Peter's dark room. Your save games are stored on film. That's cute. It's nice to see the save feature in this game being entirely dedicated to one of Peter's most iconic hustles. He needs these goddamn pictures for rent money. This shit is not a game. Just like me. Except about saving my game. Because I always save my game, bitch. I have no clue who this motherfucker is. Hmm. What's going on over here? Who the heck? He sure took off in a hurry. Yikes! Not so fast. Come on, move it! This wall is coming down. Shocker and a group of goons have taken off into Grand Central Station to take some hostages to put some distance between them and Spider-Man. The game actually gives you an entire Grand Central Station to play around in. This isn't the last time you'll see this level either. You'll actually be returning here at a different time for a different villain. Ow! I burned my hand! At night. After stopping all of Shocker's guys, Spider-Man finds the Shocker. So you must be Quilt Man, Padded Pete, Mr. Triple Ply? Oh, I've got it! The Cushion. 
I'm the Shocker. I tell you not to forget it, but you won't be around long enough to worry about that. Now say goodbye to Mr. Innocent Bystander, sucker. You be squirting, or you on the cream team? Your booty real wet? Do it clap. <laughs> Do it grip the meat. <gasps> ah! Help! What's going on? You really ought to pay more attention. Sometimes this game is really stupid. After another wave of goons, Shocker busts a giant hole into the ground, leading into the sewers. Spider-Man says fuck it, leaps in, ending level 5. This entire next level is just chasing Shocker through a sewer, while beating up as many goons as possible, and solving sewer-related puzzles to help you progress through the level. These goons are really just your average masked criminals. They'll run at you and try to fight you hand to hand, unless you run into one with a gun. Some of these guys have armor too, but... They're no match for any explosive barrel lying around the room. This game really lets you just throw anything at anyone. I'm glad they brought this mechanic back for Spider-Man PS4. That's a really deep cut, guys. I love you, Insomniac. You're doing a great job. Often, these levels have small secrets hidden inside of them. Whether they be hidden rooms or off-the-beat interactions, this game usually has something hidden off to the side for you to find. These golden spiders are placed in an odd spot in each level whether it be open, behind closed doors, or on a building you may not have thought to be on. They give you more moves, which expands the combat as you collect more and more. You can access these commands on the pause menu, which you can reference at any time. Anyway, Spider-Man finally makes it through the poopy water labyrinth and finally finds Shocker. He chases after him, and the next level begins. Y y prepare to get really familiar with the end level screen, because every... Every 10 minutes, if you're playing this game on, like, normal timing, you're gonna find- you're, you're gonna be running into this fucking screen every 10 minutes, and it's gonna get annoying. I gotta give him credit. Shocker's a fast runner. Holy! Shocker stands at the end of a row of subway tunnels, and you have to avoid his blasts as you make your way towards him. I tried rushing through this section, and I kept dying every time I did. If you want to beat him, the best bet is to go slowly up the tunnels and plan your web zips with the aiming mode. This is sort of like your standard aiming mode in any Spider-Man game. I think probably the most apt comparison is Spider-Man PS4. You get you you can just shoot a web wherever you want with the with the web button, but if you actually want to web zip, you can point to wherever you want to web zip and just go if the thing is green. If you make it past the tunnels, you can meet Shocker in the last room of his section. Here, your only task is to kick his ass so you can tell you where the vulture ran off to earlier. Yeah, you remember that? It's been a while. It's been a while since since Vulture ran off, so I I, I forgive you if you don't remember. You just give him a good spanking, and he's all yours. When you do, He'll tell Spider-Man that Vulture has been hiding away in an old clock tower, and that's where Spider-Man goes next, but not before he makes Shocker his bitch by taking his clothes and running around in them. Fuck you, Herman! You fucking pussy! Spider-Man shows up to the clock tower, and it is completely loaded with all kinds of hazards. Spider-Bots will throw themselves at you or fire stingers at you, Bombs are fucking blowing up the staircase and the supports of the building are fucking engulfed in fire. Flying up this tower at top speed is the best way to avoid dying, which by the way, takes you back to the very beginning of the level if you do. Most levels in this game tend to have a large, sizably open area for you to take advantage of Spider-Man's movement. But what makes this level so notable is the fact that it forces you to use those abilities in a much smaller space traveling upward. I think uh, this is a good level. It's also a very fucking hectic and hard level. Once you finally make it to the very top, you can find the vulture, but he makes a break for it as the level ends and you have to get familiar with the save screen again. You chase him outside, and Vulture actually makes chase. Spider-Man now has to chase the Vulture, who actually starts putting obstacles in Spider-Man's way by breaking down billboards and water towers that will fall on the people of New York if you don't web them up. I actually really like this mechanic. 
It's something that's repeated throughout most chase sections in this game from this point onward, but I actually hope a feature like this returns in a later game. I mean, I guess it kind of did with the QTEs in, in Spider-Man PS4. <sighs> you finally catch up to the Vulture, and you beat the shit out of him with ease. Spider-Man finally catches him, leaves his old ass for the cops, finally tying this whole jewelry robbing scheme all together. But back at Oscorp. <clears throat> uh, we have a problem, sir. Our systems are detecting two distinct targets. Both genetic signatures resemble Spider-Man's. Take a look at this map. As you can see, each target is unique, but both have characteristics of arachnid DNA. We don't have time to dawdle. Have the HKs force both targets into the same area. Once they're together, capturing both subjects shouldn't be a problem. Am I making myself clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Scorpion shows up on the run from spider bots who were originally after Spider-Man and have mistaken Scorpion for him. The reason for this is actually pretty interesting. The reason that they think Scorpion is Spider-Man is because they're looking for arachnid DNA, and scorpions are considered to be arachnids. I actually like that, that's kinda cool. Anyway, Scorpion runs into a parking garage that Peter Parker just happened to be riding the elevator inside. It's going to be weird going back to the subway station after my battle with Shocker. Still, taking photos of the repairs is easy money, so I can't really complain. Easy money? When will I learn to keep my mouth shut? So now Spider-Man and Scorpion have to beat the shit out of like 40 spider bots. These spiders are actually different from the ones you can find in the Vulture Tower. These ones are purple with exposed circuitry, and they only have one objective. To chase down Spider-Man and bring him back to Oscorp. I think I think it's because in this game, Spider-Man's spider bite is actually from Oscorp. Uh, I think they say this in a cutscene, and correct me if I'm wrong. After all that shit beating, Scorpion decides that Spider-Man is actually a part of these spider bots and well, now you gotta beat the shit out of him, too. This fight is fairly interesting, seeing as Scorpion has always been this weird parallel to Spider-Man. An arachnid-themed superhuman with an appropriate costume who's able to leap around, crawl on walls, and challenge you from a distance. This is the same way you've fought every other enemy in this game. Spider-Man, of course, manages to defeat him, and stops to take a look at one of the Spider-Bots. The level ends. So now, the game is done fucking around and adapting other Spider-Man villains and shit. What I actually think is really interesting is that these villains' costumes are adapted with just as much comic accuracy as Spider-Man's costume is. Shocker is one of those characters whose costume changes like Deadpool's does. It's more like a uniform that usually looks the same every time, but with small alterations or paneling differences. Shocker here has pants. That's about it. That's, that's the only thing that's different with his design. Vulture looks as much like his comic book version as he possibly could, stripes going down his costume and everything. He looks like he could just be any old version of the Vulture, much less the Raimi one, if there even was a Raimi one. This is so comic accurate that I'm not even sure that it would look like this if, if Raimi ever did Vulture. Scorpion is the only one who looks different from his typical comic look. He's actually wearing a costume he wore once in the comics, which I guess must have caught on for a short while, since the Neversoft Scorpion also wore this blue version of the costume. So pretty much all three of these guys are wearing like 80 to 100% accurate outfits. I feel like this was done because Spider-Man himself hadn't been adapted very much before, and since Spider-Man himself gets to wear his goofy old outfit, it wouldn't really make sense if nobody else got to as well. I've always wished I could see a live-action Spider-Man flying around fighting villains who look this comic accurate, and just seeing these guys try to stop me from beating the video game is enough to satisfy that dream. At least until I complain about it in a video or something again. I I'm happy right now. Then, the video game adapts the scene from the festival, where the Green Goblin first appears. You see, before this, Norman Osborn was fired by the board, just like he was in the movie. 
He then moves on to the scene where he tests the Green Goblin serum on himself, which actually changes the context of this scene quite a bit when compared to the movie. Before, Norman became the Goblin to prove that his serum worked so that his lab would be funded, only to be fired later. But instead, the firing motivates him to test the serum on himself, making him the Goblin. Then he just decides to attack the parade in a cutscene that sums up this scene from the movie at an almost comical speed. Play the cutscene. Too bad Peter had to work. Yeah. I'm just glad you're here. I can't wait for my dad to meet you. Oh, Harry. <laughs> Spider-Man still has to save Mary Jane from the Goblin, which is done fairly easily. Are you alright? Yeah, thanks. You were great back there. Thanks. I have to go deal with, you know. Oh, yeah. Thanks again. No problem. Grab hold of a rogue balloon anytime. Rescuing damsels is my specialty. Go get him, tiger. <laughs> This photo is actually going to be pretty important later. After leaving MJ to start beating up on the goblin, he will almost immediately try to fly away. You of course must chase him, but much like the vulture mission before, Green Goblin will try to destroy buildings around New York that you must web up to stop them from falling. He, he really upped the fucking ante. He's like, taking out support beams for like major fucking shit. Green Goblin wants to kill like, hundreds of people on the street. Once you secure the buildings, it's time to beat the fucking shit out of the goblin. Honestly, air combat is where Spider-Man dominates in this game. Most enemies you challenge in the air, especially ones that you've been chasing around, move a lot slower than you do, meaning that you can practically run circles around them laying on punches and kicks that enemies usually have no way to counter. Essentially, in the air, Green Goblin is a great big turkey, so he flies off with Spider-Man still chasing him, and the level ends. The next level starts with Spider-Man meeting Green Goblin over a bunch of buildings. He's still no different from the last level, meaning beating him for half his health in mid-air is no challenge. Once he reaches half health, he crashes into the skylight of one of the buildings. Here. Green Goblin completely turns the fucking tables. You meet him inside for a fight, and he's way more capable of challenging you than before. Green Goblin can now grab you at any moment, slamming you into the floor, or jumping on your body. He even has his own fucking combos that you can't escape from once they start. This is a tough ass fight. This one actually took me a couple tries, and I think I, I, think I was on normal difficulty. But if you finally manage to kick his ass, He'll run out the door to his glider. You'll have to beat him off his glider again, which is pretty easy. And once you do, he'll run off into another building. It seems to be some sort of warehouse storing these massive Tesla-esque machines. Odd enough, Green Goblin actually seems to be running away from Spider-Man. And once you finally catch him and beat him, he says this. You misguided fool. I've offered you the world and you've thrown it away. Wow. I'll show you of your deluded ideals soon enough. Save it. You're done. <laughs> That's what you think. I've arranged for a little parting gift. <laughs> Throughout downtown, our bombs have planted filled with a deadly gas. When they go off, well, use your imagination. <laughs> You might be able to stop them, or you can try to stop me. The choice is yours, hero. Ah, I can't let him get away. But if I don't stop those devices, the results could be catastrophic. I'll have to deal with the Green Menace later. I can't let those bombs go off. Bomb squad time, baby. I, I'm not stealing that joke. I'm, I'm fully acknowledging who this joke belongs to. This next level is one of the hardest levels in the game. Depending on what difficulty you're on, it'll either be a slight challenge or you'll wanna rip your hair out. You have to take Spider-Man from building to building while disabling bombs on each one. The problem 
is that each building has those green flying fucks from earlier levels stalking the bombs, and this giant spotlight will alert robots of Spider-Man's presence. You'll have to narrowly avoid the spotlights while also taking out the bombs. I recommend picking up any health or web pickups you see, because you'll need them to have enough health to get to the end, and you'll also need enough webbing to stop these robots from attacking you. It's a difficult balance, but once you finally make it, the level ends. But the goblin isn't done yet. This is the fourth level in a row where you have to fight the green goblin again. But this time, he sends his razor bats after you. It's your standard fighting robot enemies in the air segment that this game has already done before. I won't even bother explaining it. This script is, is nearly 3,000 words long already. You know what? Fuck it, I'm going over time. So, it kind of is your standard robot fighting enemies segment, except these guys come in much larger packs and they're much faster than those green flying robots you fought earlier in the game. There are a lot of them, but most of them can easily be dispatched with your web blasts, or the impact webbing, or whatever the fuck. You can beat up as many of these as you can, but Green Goblin just keeps dumping them out, so Spider-Man decides to run away from the Razor Bats, and after picking up a piece of one, he takes it home and finds out it was developed by Oscorp. Peter, you... You don't need a micro... That's not what that's for. You don't use a microscope to read text on, a, on an object. You... And that's not even how a microscope works either. You're not even supposed to put the whole fucking... You're not supposed to put the whole object you're inspecting under there. You're supposed to break a piece off of it, goddammit. Peter, you're a fucking idiot. After Peter discovers that Oscorp was the one developing these robots, he decides that he has to commit a crime and break into the building. While Norman finds a picture taken by one of his spider bots earlier, he knows Spider-Man has a connection to Mary Jane, and now he's gonna go kidnap her. Meanwhile, Peter breaks into the Oscorp building. The game now tries its hand at a fully stealth-focused level. Now before I break down how the stealth works, I will say this. This game is not built for stealth. Spider-Man can only hide within the dark spots of any given room. You can tell that Spider-Man is hidden when his icon is turned from the classic Spider-Man head into a dark blue variant. Guys look, guys look, it's the Raimi black suit, oh my god. Man, this design is so lazy that a video game tie-in accidentally makes a five year early reference to it by simply just making the Spider-Man design black. Fucking lazy ass design. Anyway, Spider-Man is only hidden when his icon is black. And if it's not, Spider-Man is incredibly visible to anyone in the area and you will be seen. There is no stealth takedown system either, so if you've played any other Spider-Man game, you'd just assume that you'd have to sneak around every guard without removing them from the environment, making your objective much harder. And what's your objective? Collecting five PNGs off of five different computers and using them to unlock a door that travels deeper into the building. You can see which computers have these codes by simply checking each screen, but without the ability to silently remove the guard walking the office space, any sensible person would just run through the building like a madman picking up every code while the alarms blare. The alarms don't stop you from getting the codes, but the guard robots will. These robot guards have a large amount of health, which means fighting them is pretty much worthless. Your best bet is to scan every computer in the room as best as possible and make it out of there with as many codes as you can, regardless of whether you're spotted or not. Once these robots start coming, make a break for it and hide in any dark corner you can. If a guard does see you, he has to run off to a control panel to start the alarm. So, if you can beat up a guard before he manages to signal the alarm, you'll be safe. But these guards can be slippery, and if you aren't quick, they will run off. And sometimes, the alarms will just go off by themselves. It's pretty funny though, because you can actually hear some of the guards talking themselves through their shifts. Man, my feet are killing me. Anyway, once you get the codes, you can put them together to proceed to the next level. Oh, that's funny. You can even see Spider-Man's reflection on the screen as he puts the code in. Spider-Man plunges further and further into the depths of the Oscorp building. He stumbles into a conversation between two scientists discussing a dangerous chemical Oscorp is working on. Spider-Man decides that he must destroy it, seeing as Oscorp is definitely connected to the Green Goblin. Not before I decide to break all this man's computer monitors. In the labs, the security is a lot more challenging. 
Laser grids cover certain areas, robot guards are always ready to come shoot you down en masse, and security cameras cover a lot of the area. You'll need to activate terminals A and B, and set them up in the central vat. Then, you'll repeat this process for terminals C and D. Once you do this, the machine stops, and the level simply ends. There are only four levels left in the game. We are nearly finished with the main campaign. But before we do that, have you ever wanted to wear my suits? I hope not, because that'd be weird. But if you do, I have something that will quell your weird fantasy. My pal Elijah, also known as Scarlet Riley Designs, has been cooking up this pattern based on my Nick V2 suit. Now, if you don't know what a pattern is, I'll tell you. It's basically a digital file of a Spider-Man suit which you can send to any of the usual Spidey cosplay suppliers like Heroes Time or Zentai Zone, and they'll make it into a real costume for you to wear. If you check the link in the description, you'll be able to find this pattern for sale. Please, please consider picking up a pattern. My friend could really use some monetary support, and if this pattern sale goes well, we'll get to work making the rest of my closet into digital patterns for you guys to pick up and wear. Please consider picking up a pattern, and let's get on with the video. Now Spider-Man has to fight a giant fucking robot. He only found this giant fucking thing because he got lost wandering through the Oscorp building. You'll have to take out a couple electric robo nipples on the robot to be able to kill it, which is made much more difficult by the swarm of enemies flying around it. There's nothing to do in this room other than destroying the giant robot. And I even booted up the level one last time before writing this part to look myself. I combed through this entire room no secret. Spider-Man destroys the robot and proceeds to Norman Osborn's office, the same one we saw Norman in earlier. Spider-Man finds the file that Norman has with the picture of him and Mary Jane, and he realizes he knows they're connected. He decides that he has to escape the building now to save Mary Jane, and instead of jumping out the window or something, he decides to leave the same exact way he came in. Search and destroy pattern. Find the intruder and neutralize with extreme prejudice. I don't know how they figured out about MJ, but I have to get to her before Goblin does. I should be able to get back out the same way I got in, and only a couple zillion heavily armed androids between me and it. No prob. Obviously, these previous floors are flooded with security, which you have to get around. They know you're here, and there's no hiding from them. You'll be leaping and jumping over security robots like a football player, squirting webs in their face as you run by. You'll even see the way you entered the building being slightly fortified to keep you from exiting. But of course, it won't be enough to stop you. You're Spider-Man. Spider-Man makes it back to the air vent he came in before, and the level finally ends. Meanwhile, Mary Jane comes back from getting groceries, only to find a massive fucking hole in her New York apartment. Green Goblin blew a hole in that bitch so he could get the drop on MJ, and he grabs her and takes off like a Chris Hansen predator. You basically just have to take off after him, the same way you usually chase after most villains in this game. He'll put a couple explosive gadgets in your way, but a well-timed jump should get you over them. Your chase with Goblin ends at the Brooklyn Bridge, where he simply just drops MJ off at the top of it. The game asks you to save her, which, once again, is as simple as swinging over to her and then dropping her off a couple meters away. Now it's time to give Goblin a final ass beating. You'll basically be beating him off his glider, only to take him to the ground to challenge him there, where he's a much more formidable foe. He's still equipped with the same combos he beat your ass with earlier in the game, so taking him on is no easy feat. But if you just manage to dodge enough grabs and get enough hits in, you finally knock him down, playing the final cutscene of the game. Mr. Osborne, why? Surprise? Yes, I suppose you would be. But the best surprise is still to come. <laughs> Tell Harry, I'm sorry. Uh, I 
I'm sorry too. Mary Jane, there's something I have to tell you. I... I know, Tiger. You don't have to say. Yeah, that's my life. Complicated. Looks like you're done now. Go outside and play. Go outside and play? Um... Okay, it's no question that Tobey Maguire's performance in this game is sure an odd one. Willem Dafoe is the only other person in the cast to join him in voicing their respective characters, and I honestly think Willem Dafoe does a way better job reprising his role than Tobey does. But I mean, it's a movie tie-in game, I can't, I can't expect too much from Tobey. Looking at the cast, you can see Tobey and Willem, along with a couple lesser known names, like Marcus Chirac for playing... Spider-Man's body. Josh Keaton? The GOAT? Playing Harry Osborn? Wait, when the fuck did... When did he play Harry Osborn in this game? You see, by finagling around with the cheats menu, you'll be able to access a lot of extra hidden content within the game. By beating the game on hard, or by being a sissy and cheating like I did, you can actually play as the Green Goblin. But not as Norman, but Harry Osborn. You can actually go through the entire campaign like this, flying around on your glider and gunning down most enemies that would have been beaten with just your bare hands. This game just oozes replayability. This game hides an entire hidden campaign for you to find, jam-packed with lines from one of the greatest Spider-Man voice actors to ever do it, and a completely different moveset to explore the game with. It's almost odd how many layers this game has. You'd think this game would just be your average, silly movie tie-in game, but it's become so much more than that. Everyone praises the Ultimate Spider-Man video game for its Venom gameplay, but what about Spider-Man the movie game, huh? This one literally lets you dick around as the Green Goblin. That is when you're not fighting the camera, or, or stopping every five minutes to go through the next level screens. Okay, this game isn't perfect, but it sure as hell ain't bad. There are a bunch of other cheats to use, all letting you do things you'd never think the game would allow you to. Some of these will actually help you in-game, like giving you unlimited webbing with the organic webbing cheat I mentioned earlier. But most of these cheats just do dumb shit like give you big heads or make you short. There's this first person mode. This is okay, I guess. A lot of these cheats actually change out the Spider-Man model for other characters in-game. You can play as Mary Jane, Shocker, a selection of the criminal models, and even other Spider-Man suits from in-game. You've seen the human spider earlier and caught glimpses of the Peter Parker model, but there's one other suit that I'm sure some of you might have noticed me wearing earlier. The Alex Ross Spider-Man design, which was scrapped from the movie, but somehow made its way into this game. I'm really glad it made it. This design was one of the pioneers of the red and black Spider-Man suit, and it looks great here. This is one of the features that I actually think this game has over Spider-Man 2, its follow-up. If I remember correctly, that game had no alternative costumes, which doesn't necessarily make it a worse game. You don't need alternate costumes in your superhero game, but alternate costumes are a staple of superhero media, and their inclusion can never be a bad idea. Unless the designs suck, but honestly they usually don't in these games. Usually. There's so many things to just see in this game. I can only do so much by explaining the plot of the campaign or breaking down the mechanics and all that nerd shit. Did you know Bruce Campbell is in this game? He like heavily narrates the entirety of the tutorialized section. Like, if you just play through a lot of the bonus sections of this game, Bruce Campbell is just there. If you like Bruce Campbell, go play this fucking game. The point of this video is to get you to want to pick up a dolphin emulator, get a ISO of this game, and just sit back and play this game with a USB Xbox controller or something. And if you don't want to play the GameCube version, fine. The Xbox version of this game comes with an exclusive Craven level anyway, which takes place in the middle of the goblin levels of the game. So it's better to play on Xbox anyway. There's just something about this game that I just 
haven't been able to put to bed until this video and I just really needed to sit down and dissect it here with all of you. I don't know how many other Spider-Man games I'll cover. I'll probably continue to cover other ones I have a childhood experience with in the future like Ultimate Spider-Man or Spider-Man 2. But I'll be covering a different Spider-Man 2 next week or yeah, however long it is until October 20th. Mark your calendars folks. If you don't have a PS5, don't you worry, you'll at least be able to experience the game alongside me and my chat the second the game drops. Show the pre-order timer. The second this pre-order timer runs out, I'm live streaming this game and playing it for all of you with minimal breaks until the game is done. I'm gonna get the game, stream it for the entire night, go to bed, and then start streaming again. I'm excited to play it live with you all and I can't wait to see you there. This video is going to be a doozy, and I, I, I honestly don't know how well it'll do, so please like and subscribe. Ugh. That's all I got for you guys. That's all I got for you this week. We're doing Spider-Man 2. We're doing Spider-Man 2 next, chat. Not, not, not Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. Not Spider-Man 2, the movie, the video game. Marvel Spider-Man 2, bitch. By Insomniac. Woo!